I'm Sheila Hemphill with Texas Right to Know. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Alberto Hernandez from Spain to share with us the clinical trials and successes he has experienced utilizing ozone as an adjuvant therapy for the treatment of COVID-19. Dr. Hernandez, thank you. Hi, how are you? My pleasure is to stay with you today. Uh, thank where you are you? Thank you. Where are you calling? When, when are you? Where are you zooming in from? Sorry, say again. Where are you live? Where are you right now? I am in Ibiza. Uh huh. In a small in Spain. Wonderful. Also here we have Dr. Jim Thorpe. Jim, if you'll give a Dr. Thorpe, if you'll give an introduction, please. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Jim Thorpe, and I am a maternal fetal medicine physician, OBGYN physician, but more importantly, uh, I am very, very interested in clinical research and looking at the potential for adjuvant ozone therapy for the treatment of COVID-19 and other viral infections. I'm with um, St. Louis University um, and SSM Health out of St. Louis, but I do full-time telemedicine and research here from my home in Gulf Breeze, Florida. Dr. Dr. Hernandez, uh, I received your paper that was recently published. I believe it, uh, I was became aware of it on April 29th, entitled Two Known Therapies Could Be Useful as an Adjuvant Therapy in Critical Patients Infected by COVID-19. Could you give a, a brief about where this project took place how many patients and what kind of outcomes you've experienced? Yeah, we, we, we saw at the beginning of this, uh, of this pandemic uh, issue that vitamin C could be help a lot to this patient to stop the, the cytokine storm. So hyperinflammation of the lungs is treated now with a high dose of steroids. But the problem to give esteroids uh, is to depress the immune, immune system. So we thought vitamin C in high dose could be get them the same effect or better without depress the immune system. So this is what we thought at the beginning. And then another therapy we thought could be very useful for COVID was ozone therapy. We use a lot in a pain clinic to treat uh, several diseases, and we thought could be a, a, a play a role on this COVID infection. Uh, so after one month fighting uh, at the hospital to get the permission, we treat the first patient with a very, very uh, impressive outcome. So other doctors then trust a little bit more on us and we treat more patients, we get, we get the same, the same uh, outcome. So very fast recovery, um, very fast um, change of the progress of the disease. Um, and most of the patients discharge at home after four or five days at the hospital, and no one uh, become to intensive care for intubation. So it's a very good outcome. Do you have the stats on how many patients have been able to utilize this? And from what you just described, it sounds like you were taking the ozone treatment and able to stop the progression of the illness while they were still in just symptomatic phase one. Were these respiratory phase two? Anything, any work on the phase three inhibition? Yeah, we have this, this, the first was uh, a patient was already in intensive care and uh, came down to the ward and after 24 hours deterioration was very very fast very 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 quick so um, doctor want to put to sleep again intubation and mechanical ventilation so we got the permission to treat one patient at the beginning only one so finally we did this patient uh, one session at one o'clock a.m. and it was impressive because the patient before was tachyp neck with respiratory distress and after one session the 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 the, the FIO2 the the oxygen requirement 
come down to 0.3, which is very, very small dose of uh, oxygen. So the patient start to feel much better, no breathless anymore. Um, so we did two sessions per day at this patient. Um, we, treat, we treat him for three days and the four days was completely fine, no oxygen requirement, um, feeling great. So we keep here at the hospital for another another day and then they travel home. Oh, that's beautiful. And the most yes. impressive thing, this is why we're trying to, we're fighting here in Spain. One thing is when you when you tell something to someone, no, you have subjective uh, point of view. But when you have the results, the lab results, you know, when the train of uh, ferritin, on the train of demerody, the, you know, the train of the, the lab prognosis, but outcome uh, before awesome therapy and after awesome therapy, you see the train completely down. So this is very impressive. So we, we're trying here to fight with all these opposite people to sit down in a table and say, look, this is what we have. This is, this is not why I'm telling you because you can believe or you cannot believe. But if you have the lab results, it's very easy to demonstrate. And it's impressive because you have uh, the train rising, rising, rising. You give one session of zone and then stabilize and then come down. So, so what, 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 what you, protocol? What, 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 uh, what, excuse me, um, I didn't catch that. What specific labs were rising and rising and then dropped? with yeah we we using the uh, inflammatory markers like CRP, crp ferritin ferritin d dimer and ldh uh, basically this is five and all the patients have all all of them we found a uh, liver function a little bit impairment all of them we don't know if it's the, the ferrous in the blood, you know, but all, all of them had at the beginning uh, liver, liver impairment function. Alberto, not, very, yeah. not, very, not very much, you know, but about 100, 125, some, some of them 200 ALT or AST high. So we thought it's the, 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 the ferrous. Um, thank you for that, Alberto. Um, so did you notice um, how long after the initial ozone therapy do you see those results and did you follow any pulse oximetry readings uh, before and after the therapy? After the therapy, just the next day, the following day, we have a complete change of the training. So they administered at one in the morning. Yeah, we, we did the, the lab result about eight, 8 in the morning, 8 in the morning, and then we repeat the day after. So we did after one session, and the train is, is completely down. So we sent a few cases to publish in Chess Journal uh, with the graph, because it's quite impressive. So hopefully we can get it. And can, you, another. can you describe the protocol of the ozone, the volume of blood? I understand you're using major autohemo. Can you describe the volume of blood with the volume of saline or how you did it and the gamma or the microgram per milliliter of ozone concentration, please? Yeah, we, we don't use saline here in Spain. Well, some of places do, but it's not allowed according to the Spanish society. So you, I, I'm sorry, you don't use what, Alberto? I missed that. We don't use uh, saline. They don't put saline in with the blood. No, we don't use because it's not, it's not allowed for, for a Spanish society. So, and we don't use another route because we, we try to introduce in the conventional hospital and we don't want to drive crazy everyone to say we can give awesome through the NG2, or we can we can give oxone through the another route. So we decide to do with the blood because it's the more uh, understandable for conventional doctors. Right. So 
we, we have two separate protocols, one for intensive care and one for no critical patients, which they are normally on the ward. So what, what, what we are doing now is two sessions for no critical patients, two sessions of ozone therapy. So our protocol say to remove 200 of blood, but we usually get 150, it's okay. We always use 200, of, uh, 200 mils of uh, gas with a concentration between 40 and 60. Depends of the of the time that you are going to, you know, because you have to change and the nurse has to prepare everything. So usually the, the machine is outside the room, outside the room. So we, we, we usually get more concentration for, you know, for the, the time to, to administer to the patient. So we're doing between 40 and 60 micrograms mil. 200 of volume and then twice a day for no critical patient and we we took uh, 150 mils of blood for the patient. So we got 200 perfect, but we don't, you know we we're happy with 150 or 100. It's okay. And is that six um, so hours apart or how far apart on those two applications? Well, we're doing after uh, in uh, no critical patient every 12 hours. Okay, every 12 hours on non-critical. Okay, and then for uh, critical, by definition, in ICU, is that what you're considering critical? Yeah, critical patient is in ICU, usually intubated patient, usually okay. promposition, tracheostomy, you know, a lot of comorbidities and very sick patient. So we're doing four times per day. And in these cases, we are trying to get the blood from the central line. Or, you know, Obasca from uh, renal replacement therapy, so it's very easy. And we took 200 of these patients and we, we give around 40, 50, more or less 50 micrograms mil. Uh, always 200 of, uh, of gas at the beginning. Um, so in your ICU patients, they have a port? They have a port? In your ICU patients? Yeah, usually they have central line. Oh, central line, yeah, okay. You know, because the, the, these patients are very edematous, so it's difficult to get a peripheral line. Right. So we try to central line because it's uh, four sessions per day. You don't want to, you know, you, you can get successful once or twice, but you know, it's four, four sessions per day. So we prefer to put a central line only for ozone therapy don't mix with the normal medication through the through the central line. So we got another central line, usually in femoral, and we do the therapy just for this line. Uh, how much heparin are you using in the bag or in the line? Do you well, do you, you usually the, the our kids uh, come with um, fitrate fitrate, but. Usually we give, if, if there's no anticoagulant inside, we give 20, 10 to 20 units uh, per mil of blood, remove it. So about 1,000 or 2,000 units of, of heparin in the, in, the, in the bottle. Okay. Yeah, more, more. Do you know how many patients you've been able to give this therapy to so far? Well, well, we're a very small hospital here, very small. This is why we try to ex spread out our therapy. So we, we're now, I think today was, we have 12 in totally, three in intensive care, and eight on the ward. And we have at the present one patient in intensive care. And it was very, very, very good patient to to see the effect of ozone therapy, I, I will tell you why, because doctors in intensive care don't uh, let to do this therapy. So this patient was already there for three weeks and deteriorating, and no, no urine output, kidneys fail, liver fail. And all the prognosis was very bad. 
So they finally say, okay, try it. We, do, we did two sessions, only two sessions, and the lab result changed completely. The lab result was completely different. And they say, okay, we don't see any change clinically, so we stop it. So they stop again, and after three days, the patient deteriorates again. So finally, they say, okay, we'll try ozone therapy. The patient was already prone position, requiring 1% oxygen. So after five sessions, the patient was awake with a very small oxygen requirement, passing urine, and all the parameters were improving. So, so the organs, the, the organs that had been failing started coming back on. They start to work. They start to work, yeah after five days and this was a patient who was intubated in intensive care going down yeah the patient was the patient was dying already this is why they they let they let us to do the therapy because the patient was already dying and so this is one of the one of the main proof for myself to, to make sure that the treatment is valid for intensive care patients in critical condition, because we saw already in this patient. When we try, the patient improved. When we stop, the patient deteriorate again. When we restart therapy, the patient improved. So there's no way. Fantastic. Is there any way can I can I, receive? Uh, can I just uh, ask sure. you, Alberto? So, um, what was your timing in the ICU? Was it every six hours, uh, or just does it matter? Well, we we try every six hours, but we 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 do four times per day. Four times per day in intensive okay. care. Now I know well, the. Just to, if I could just summarize what I'm understanding, you say you, usually for... every six hours, but it doesn't matter if, we, if you are doing twice shorter in time you know because there is no make any difference so it's just to facilitate the protocol because we are not doing several passes with uh, our machine so we're doing four times per day so it's okay we try every six hours but excellent so one i i just wanted to summarize what what i'm receiving from you alberto i appreciate it so i understand that there's two separate protocols that you have one for the um, not as critical patients that are in the usual hospital bed ward. And in that patient, you're using um, two of the MAH therapy every 12 hours. And your MAH therapy then consists of uh, drawing out 150 to 200 ml of their blood in a heparinized syringe with about 1,000 to 2,000 units in the blood, I assume you let that uh, drain by gravity, putting the bag on the floor. And then you put, uh, you put uh, 200 ml of medical grade ozone at a concentration of 40 to 60 gamma, that is 40 to 60 microgram per ml of gas. Then you shake it up and then you put it back in the patient. So you do that yep. twice a day on the ward, but for ICU patients, you do it four times a day. That's correct. Thank you. And then, um, did you notice any effects on these um, before and after the ozone therapy on the oxygen saturation curves, the trends? Yeah, the problem with the, the patient in intensive care is very easy because you have uh, arterial blood gas. You know, you can get the PA, P arterial oxygen, oxygenation, and you have the concentration of the oxygen, but in, in the war it's a little bit more difficult because they don't have arterial line. So we use uh, the ROX index, index, ROX index, which is saturation, divided for by FiO2, so in, it's equivalent to PA, um, PaO2 divided by FiO2, so ROCS, ROCS index is similar. And we saw these changes, 
but not immediately. We don't see immediately change, to be honest. We saw during the day, the requirement is getting better. The oxygen requirement is better. So they can reduce the concentration of from the ventilator. Um, as I mentioned before, in this patient was completely um, oxygenation 100% and come down to 0 0.3, which is very, very impressive. And what you uh, mentioned earlier. Alberto, Alberto if, if I could ask you, um, do you have any knowledge uh, from your studies or knowledge from any other studies documenting viral load before and after ozone therapy? Yeah, we, we, we want to do this also. We want to do it, we want, but it's difficult. Even we, we, we put in our trial uh, for multicentric trial, we did already this item, I eaten, but we have to remove it because not all the hospital can do it oftenly to measure the preload of viral loads before treatment and after. I don't know. I don't know yet any study about that with host therapy. We want to do it, but it's difficult because most of the hospital, they don't want to do it oftenly so even we told them okay we can do before one treatment and after five sessions because our what we saw here is the patients are improving after three sessions so after four usually they are fine so we mark an, our protocol five days and then review everything if the patient need more because we saw Earlier you give faster recovery, you know, so. So you're also, the they're also showing negative on the COVID test after five sessions and each session is twice a day. So after 10 treatments, uh, are you getting negative on the COVID test? We, we did, but we are not doing regularly. Okay. We are not doing our protocol regularly because the hospital say no too much money, they don't want to spend. So we did, we measure all the patients after therapy because they are the char at home. And then after, uh, usually they, they do after five days at home. So we did, we saw negative from some of patients. Yeah. But so we, we don't we, know we if know they, we don't know if they were no. negative after five treatments or after five days after they went home. Okay. We don't know. We want to do it, but we can't. And I understand. We tried to do it in our, in our trial, but most of the hospital complain because they don't want to do, you know, because in our, in our job description, we try to do every two days to assess, but it's not possible. So, I, I, um, and also we have, we have this uh, sensitivity problem with the test. So every test is different. So are y'all yeah, using I nasal swabs? Are y'all using for testing? Are you using the nasal swabs or blood? Well, blood. Okay. But you, we have, we have twice. We have the faster uh, test, which is in the finger. This is, you have the results in half an hour to just uh, bring the, the the finger a little bit, one drop of blood, and then you can do it. You can do formal blood test for uh, PCR. Uh, but yeah, now I, don't have I know in Italy, uh, under the uh, SIOOT there, under Dr. Franzini, who's the international president, they are doing one MAH. And uh, their most recent, I don't know if you've seen their most recent results on their 73 patients, but of their 73 patients, they were 100% improvement of phase one and phase two patients. The 24 patients who were phase three inhibited, only seven died, which is 
which is a great improvement over what we're seeing over here, which I've heard numbers of up to 80% death from, but yeah. everyone is saying the sooner you can get this to the people, the better. Over in Italy, there are over 20 hospitals under the SIOOT protocol. And then my understanding is the different protocol in Udini under Dr. Am Amato DeMonte. He had the 36 patients uh, that were pneumonia and severe breathing problems. And all 35 were able, I mean, all 36 were headed to inhibition. And after ozone, only one needed inhibition and soon recovered their afterwards. Yeah. We're in contact with, we are in contact with them to, to through the information. It's true they are doing only one session per day, and it's true they're doing a lower concentration. Um, they're doing 40. We they are, yeah, we, sometimes they're doing 30. Sometimes they're doing 30, okay. I know um, Udini with uh, DeMonte maybe, was staying 40. Yeah. Maybe at the beginning they, they were doing 30 to maybe they they were afraid or something, but yeah, but I know doing home doing infusion. 40. They're sending these devices into the home of people who've tested positive and are outpatient. And I believe that's critical is to try to get um, a protocol for outpatient. So Dr. Thorpe, I'm going to throw this over to you. Uh, any other questions before we start what we hope to accomplish with some interested parties over here in the States. Any other questions? Are anybody in the chat? Any um, other questions? I, I, so um, I'm just curious as to um, just pose a question, Alberto, to you. What would you say is the mechanism of ozone therapy on how does it work for treating COVID or any other viral infection well i think i think there are some some uh, ways to treat this disease so first of all uh, we know there is a, an inflammation no there is a hyperinflammation probably as reaction of uh, the, the the viral load, so we we know the oxone is a, is a very uh, potent anti-inflammatory uh, substance. So we 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 know this is one of the the, the mechanisms to to treat this this disease. Secondly, uh, regarding to the oxygenation, the oxone we know also they are they are getting effects on the on the red cells so we know that they are doing some fun some functions sorry some functions there so increasing the atp energy uh, increasing the 23 dp dpg which is uh, increase the delivery to the tissues and also we know this the circulation is improving don't forget the night the it's releasing nitric oxide which is anti-aggregant antiplatelets so these patients are suffering from a micro micro thrombus in the circulatory pulmonary uh, vessels so even increase the, the the release of prostaglandins like PGI2, which is a vasodilator prostaglandin. So this is some of the mechanisms ozone therapy can help. And then you say how ozone is acting to the virus. We don't know, but we knew the ozone is very oxidative uh, therapy and it, it looks like uh, the virus in the capside has uh, some proteins, protein S, with a lot of uh, cysteine residues, and, uh, potentially very, very sensitive to the oxidative therapy. So could be a, a, a treatment, 
when the when the virus is in the blood, of course, because if the virus is in your cells, you cannot do anything. And also the mechanisms described for these Italian people, also uh, increasing the NFR2, uh, which is uh, a potential key uh, to block the ACE receptor, which is necessary to introduce this, the, the virus to the cells. So I think, uh, as far as we know about this pathology of the virus, in all the points has been described, the awesome therapy has a good action in all of them. I was thrilled to have you, Dr. Hernandez, because after, if you've seen my website, any, any article I can find, I'm posting it here, I do daily updates, and this PDF file is a, co co a collation of all these different articles in one file so people can do word searches. Um, I'm also having a Spanish version that I, if I can get them updated at the same time I do, I'm a little behind on my Spanish versions. But um, after reading all of these, I want you to see that your statement, I felt was the most concise that consolidated the information varying from Wuhan. I uh, had some information come to me from the University of Wuhan from Italy and Spain. And so your statement here is what I have been spotlighting because I believe just as you conveyed, this really is what's happening. It's helping with the brutal inflammatory effect of the cytokine storm that's resulting in the thrombosis, the blood clots, which are causing the cascading effect of the organ failure. And once ozone gets in there, and what's interesting, I had, um, this is the depiction, the CDC depiction of the virus with these protein spikes, which are necessary to penetrate for the virus to get into a cell. I photoshopped them with a very knowledgeable ozone practitioner to basically talk about the oxidation or what we know as lay people of oxidation of rusting off, rusting. So basically rusting off the spikes such that they cannot penetrate into the cell. Now, my understanding that that is theory as well as uh, a lot of this is graphic depiction. So I didn't know if you had any input or research that would substantiate or your understanding of what's it doing with the virus body. And we pray that, God, that President Trump, who is over the FDA, which is an agency, who does have the power to hopefully correct these wrongs so that we can bring this life-saving therapy and help resolve this pandemic and help restore our health and our economy. So that's what we need to be doing. Look, look, I know you are, look, I, I know you are recording this, this uh, conference. I will tell you something to you and to everyone who wants to listen to this. There is no more effective therapy at the present better than awesome therapy in this patient. There is no, there is no way. There is no any other drug better than awesome therapy for these patients. And I can discuss everyone here, wherever they want evidence. We will talk about evidence. We will talk uh, about everything what they want. But I can tell you, there is no other medication uh, working better than awesome, faster, better, and getting good results of this patient so beautiful it's just time to get in i'm sure beautiful they are doing everything they want you know they they want clinical trial we request clinical trial they want multi-center uh, study we did multi-center study they want you know everything they want but at the end you know it, it, there is nothing better so Beautiful. We're not fighting for now because I know it's late, but something happened in winter, we have to be there like another therapy to make sure the autumn is inside the hospital because the Italy uh, experience, our experience, and you know, the other people are doing in South America, some of them contact to me directly and I am helping there because they are very poor countries with no resources at the hospital and they're doing awesome therapy and they 
are emailing me with the outcome and it's Beautiful. impressive also so all of them um are, are working well so it's just time we need to involve important doctors here this is why i realized there is no way one person there is no way to to talk free we need I to would be happy and to discuss one to one one to one with these people they don't believe they say it's toxic I would love to because communicate with the people that you're describing you, in other countries you, yeah how can you get more than 4,000 studies in food med is this toxic exactly how come how come they're giving more than one thousand one hundred thousand uh, uh, auto hemotherapy in germany is this toxic you know it doesn't make sense it's the same like nitric oxide with even worse because ozone therapy has a history and there are a lot of papers so we know it's not toxic come on of course if you give the the like water if you get 20 liters to the body it's toxic of course Everybody you summed it up beautifully therapy, but even the ozone therapy the rate of the, the rate of side effect of ozone is 0 0.0007 percent so there is no another system with less side effect than ozone therapy so our governments are working on false in. Our governments are making rules based upon false information. We hope that more communications like this will be able to break through this wall so that we can bring forth this life-saving therapy. Um, I would invite people to visit www.texasrighttoknow.com and learn more as we hear more successful stories coming from around the world of how we can solve this terrible pandemic and bring back healing and health and economic future back to our country. So thank you, Dr. Alberto.